All right, welcome back from the break. Um, during the break, I had a question, and let me reiterate what I was saying. In a, the state of Indiana, this person was from the state of Indiana. <clears throat> In the state of Indiana, you are not required to voluntarily disclose. When asked, you cannot give misleading information. That's what the rule says. Doesn't say you have to say yes, all right? Where's that person? Way back. There. Okay, yeah. Get what I'm saying? I don't. I can't lie. But it the 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 actual statute says I can't give misleading information. So if I say, hey, we don't talk about it, that's not misleading. I can legally say that if that's the discussion that my seller and I say, hey, look, here's what we should do. We know this has happened. If we get asked. I would suggest to you, Mr. Seller, that we just tell them we don't talk about it. Let them go figure it out and decide. And he says, yeah, that's the route we want to go. <clears throat> then that's what we could say. That's not misleading. So I don't have to say, yes, there was a, a, a homicide here. I could say we just don't talk about it. That's not, that's not misleading. The rule doesn't say I have to say yes if I know. The rule says I can't give misleading. That's why I was joking earlier when I said it had to involve an attorney getting drunk because most people would think if I ask a question, I've got to say yes. Well, the rule doesn't say I have to tell them. The rule says I have to not give misleading information. So we could just say we have chosen to not discuss this topic, which is not misleading. That's the truth. All right. If you got another question later, Holly, come see me. So let's talk a little bit about a listing agreement. What are they? What do they do? What do they look like? How do they work? A listing agreement is a, uh, a legally binding contract between a broker or the agent, which would be the managing broker, and the principal of the deal, which could be the buyer. Well, in this case, it's the seller because we're talking specifically listing agents. So let me back that up. It's a, an agreement between the seller and the agent. When we deal with uh, the selling agency next, that's between the buyer. So it's an employment contract. That is something that a lot of people don't understand. This is not technically a real estate contract. This is an employment contract that confers that special agency to me. Remember, special agency. I'm hired to do one thing in one area of a person's life. That one thing is to market this property for sale. I represent, i.e. an agent of the seller in this process. And that listing agreement is what is the express agency that defines clearly their responsibilities. Hey, Mr. Seller, you have to be honest and tell me what's wrong with the property. You have to be, uh, you have to allow me to access to the property to show it to potential buyers. You have to do this. I, in turn, will market the pro property sufficiently to find you a buyer and bring you a buyer. So it is an express agency in this particular case, it is written under the statute of frauds, but it is an employment contract between me as a managing broker and the client, which is now client because I'm creating the agency. All right. Now that agency or that listing agreement, there are three types of listing agreements. The most common one that we all use in about every state I have spoken in is the exclusive right to sell. Exclusive means the seller can only enter into one of these and I have the exclusive right as the agent. And therefore, when that property closes, it confers or declares me as the procuring cause and I get paid my commission no matter who brings the buyer. All right. 
the fact that I was smart enough to get the seller to sign this exclusive right to sell, in fact, makes me the procuring cause. And when it closes, I get paid my commission no matter who brings the buyer. If I bring the buyer, if you bring the buyer, if the seller himself brings the buyer, if Santa Claus brings the buyer, I get paid no matter what. It is the big mama Luca. It offers the most protection to the agent because it confers or declares me as procuring cause. Now I know in the real world, most what really happens in the real world is a seller calls me and goes, hey, Raymond, I want you to list my house. So they have sought me out. The state commission in every state actually looks at it as though I walked up to a house, knocked on the front door and go, hey, dude, you're going to sell your house today. and You're going to use me to do it. And that seller said, OK, I'll do it. And therefore, I am the procuring cause on the sale of that property. I get paid no matter what. Now, just below that, in protection to the agent, is this thing called the exclusive agency agreement. The exclusive agency. What this exclusive agency agreement says is that there must be an agency relationship on both sides of the table for the commission to be paid. What did I just say? What I said was, if I bring the buyer as a limited agent or dual agency in, in other states, there is agency on both sides, that commission gets paid. If you bring the buyer to me, then there is agency on both sides, that commission gets paid. If the seller brings the buyer himself, there would be no agency between them because they cannot have agency. The commission does not get paid. So virtually, I get paid no matter what, except for the seller actually bringing the proper uh, buyer. If the seller finds the buyer himself, no commission gets paid. Now, in Indiana and about 10 other states, West Virginia, North Carolina, Colorado, Louisiana, there is no form for this, right? <laughs> this is not one that you would actually want to lead your conversation with because it is least protective. What do you mean by that, Raymond? What I mean by that is there is a chance that you could not earn your commission if the seller finds the buyer. So we actually don't have a form in the state of Indiana. We actually have to use the first form and then we write in the further agreement some exclusion. Hey, if the seller brings the buyer himself, no commission will be paid to the listing agent. <clears throat> so if there's no form for it, why do we use it? Good question. I see this agency form or this this actual hard form as being a final effort, last ditch, go to kind of attempt when dealing with for sale by owners. Now we are all told, hey, a for sale by owner is a warm lead. They actually want to sell their house. They're just not using you, Raymond. Okay, go convert that to a client. Okay, I'll go do it. And that's what a lot of new agents are told to do out of the gate. Hey, go talk to for sale by owners and get them to list with you. Cool. We go in, we do that. We say, hey, list with us. And they go, oh, I'll list with you. And ta-da, we have a new client. Occasionally, there's going to be a for sale by owner that says, you know what? I don't really need an agent. Thank you very much. Have a good day and show you to the door. This second form here could be that last ditch where you put your hand on the door and you get ready to leave and you stop and you say, OK, I'll tell you what I do. I'll make you a deal. How about you let me list the property for sale? If I bring a buyer or another agent brings a buyer, you pay me. 
if you bring the buyer, you won't pay me. <clears throat> that Will you meet me halfway on that? Knowing that we have access to an MLS system and probably we got a better shot at bringing a buyer than that seller had <clears throat> because it's still for sale, which means he hasn't brought one yet. So you could use this as a last ditch effort to go, dude, let's have a race. You sign this exclusive agency form, which says I get to market the property. And if I bring a buyer or another agent brings a buyer to you, it's because of the MLS. Therefore, you'll pay us a commission. But if you bring your own buyer, Mr. Seller, then you don't pay me. That seller might go, OK, I'll do that. Sure, that is called exclusive agency. The third one is called open agency. The key with open agency, open agency allows the seller to enter into as many of these as possible. Now, why would any agent do that? Most agents would not do that. So let's get that out of the way. That's the obvious big elephant in the room. I don't want to list a property if I know that you, Bob, are listing it and Sharon's listing it and Holly back there who asked me the question earlier is listing it because there's a chance, one in four, that they are not going to call me. So in an open agency, the person that gets the credit, using finger quotes, for the listing is the one who brings the buyer. So what happens is one of those four people that I just mentioned either gets limited agency or nothing. Open agency says the person that brings the buyer gets the credit for the listing. So they get both sides, which we would call limited agency in Indiana. Other states call it dual agency. Some states that have outlawed dual agency probably don't have this type of listing in their, well, they, yeah, they would, because there's still another reason why it's vi viable. All right. <clears throat> so you can enter into as many, the seller can enter into as many open agencies as they want. And whoever brings the buyer gets the listing side. So someone needs to ask, what good are they? Good question. There are some cases when open agency makes sense. And typically open agency tends to make sense when the property is sufficiently unique enough that it could draw buyers from multiple different MLS systems. Let's say there is a cabin on a lake sitting in the middle of your state. It's a very well sought after piece of property. Nice little cabin right on the lake. You can take your boat out and fish and do whatever you want to do. Where is that buyer sitting? Well, that buyer may be sitting in that city or it's sitting in the northern part of the state. Perhaps it's completely sitting in another state. There are people all the time, oh, well, I own a cabin at Del Hollow in uh, Kentucky. So that is a case where the seller may say to somebody, hey, Raymond, I want to have an open listing with you, and you are going to get your MLS in the city just north of the lake. And I'm going to talk to another agent who has in the MLS system that is south of the lake because that buyer could come from there. And I'm going to talk to another agent who has the MLS system in the eastern half of the state so that that buyer may come from there. So there is potentially good times that that open listing could be viable. Now, the agent still is running a risk, meaning I'm going to end up doing all this work and potentially being nothing because the buyer came from the other agent that's marketing the property in the eastern half of this state, as opposed to the southern half and the northern half. 
but it does make sense, all right? <clears throat> there is a net listing. A net listing can be potentially illegal in your state. You need to check the rules. In Indiana, it has to be declared that it is a net listing. What a net listing is, is when the agent gets to keep any amount above whatever the seller wants to net out of the sale of the deal. So if the seller says, look, I need to net a hundred grand and they list the property for 104,000, the agent keeps four grand. If they list it for 107,000, the agent keeps 7,000. That's why you can quickly see any devious person could see why they could be potentially illegal because what could happen is some agent could tell a little old lady, hey, don't worry, honey, I'll get your $40,000 back that you paid for this house 20 years ago and anything over that 40, I'll keep for me. And then you go out and sell a house for $350,000. <laughs> I see a couple of you laughing. I laugh all the time. That's why it's potentially illegal. You have to declare it's a net listing so that if there's ever an issue, the commission can look at this deal and go, no, Raymond, there's probably a problem with that. So I'm going to give you now eight benefits on why the seller should use a listing agent. Feel free to use these in your notes or if you're at home, download the PDF and use these in your listing presentation. Why should, or what are the benefits of a seller using a listing agent? Obviously you get to tap into the expertise of the agent. We are experts in pricing. We know how to do it. We've done them called CMAs. Sellers do not have to vet contractors. Most real estate agents have a pool of people that they have dealt with before and know their qualifications, their abilities, how well they work, how easy they work, will they get paid at closing. That seller can tap into that. Obviously agents, we have knowledge of our local market. This local market may be different than Miami's local market, than Orlando, than uh, Prairie View, Texas. We have access to an MLS. This is the key concept to me. This is the killer. You know, that for sale by owner may have 10 people drive up and down his street and sees his sign. Some MLSs may have 10,000 other agents that have buyers. This leverage that MLS. <clears throat> we have this uh, authority figure concept so that when we speak with buyers, we are understand the process. We know where the pitfalls are going to be. Your seller needs to take advantage of this by using the authority of a seller or a skilled realtor to represent them in the sale. We are, in fact, by definition, professional negotiators. <coughs> I would say, excuse me, I would suggest you guys take some classes on negotiation. That would be pretty cool. We also have ethical rules that we follow. That is beneficial to the seller, believe it or not. And you need to make that clear to them that yes, there are some ethical rules that we follow. And obviously we have all of the paperwork that the seller is going to need that was written by legal professionals in our state association. So we don't have to worry about what does the purchase agreement cover this? Well, yeah, because it's actually a standardized purchase agreement written by the state board or the state association of realtors. Now the seller still has defects they need to take care of. And we have talked about that. They have to disclose certain information and they have to disclose what is called a material defect. And a material defect is a fact or a significant uh, issue that would impact the value of the property. We have to disclose this. Hey, dude, there's a hole in the roof. Property owners are only required to disclose the information that they know to be true. 
That is called the material defect. Other defects may have to be disclosed, like zoning issues. So what I'm saying here is not just material, not just physical defect. If there's a zoning issue, there's an environmental issue. If there's easements and encroachments, all of these things have to be disclosed to the buyer. And as an agent, you are under no obligation to help that buyer determine what is going on in the surrounding properties. Matter of fact, you should not talk about what might happen. You should be responsible for only disclosing facts that you know about the property. Now, there are these things called latent defects. These are defects that are not obviously visible right out of the gate. The best example of that is termites, right? And you guys all know that you can't use the word termite anymore in the state of Indiana. We actually have to call them termite Americans. <laughs> no, <laughs> they're wood destroying insects because you have to be certified through a school to identify them as truly termites. Could be carpenter ants, could be, you know, whatever. But that would be an example of a latent defect. You look around the room we're in right here and go, look, this room looks perfect. You have buyer comes in, has it inspected, finds termites by an authorized termite inspector. And he says, dude, you got termites, we want out. Okay, you're gone. Now, here's the question that I always get. Do you have to redisclose? Well, hell yeah, you do. Because now a latent defect is something that you now know. It now becomes a material defect and you fail to disclose. Remember what fraud was? It is the intentional misrepresentation or the failure to give the true picture of the property is fraud. If we fail to disclose something that we now know to be true, then we could be in trouble. So yes, we should redisclose. All right, that is the listing side. I want to talk a little bit about the selling side. 